Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Heard Museum for this fall's Simon Ortiz and Labriola Center Lecture on Indigenous Land, Culture, and Community. Tonight's event is co-sponsored by the Heard and Arizona State University's English and American Indian Studies Departments. My name is Mark Scarp, the Communications and Public Relations Manager here at the Heard. I bring you greetings and regrets from our interim director and CEO, John Bulla, who could not be with us this evening. John flew to New York City this morning to meet with our new director and CEO, David Roche, who was just appointed by the Board of Trustees to that position this week. He will begin work here in Phoenix in January. I know he's eager to meet a number of us here at the museum, and I hope when he arrives that we will all extend to him a warm enthusiastic welcome to Phoenix. And so on behalf of the Heard Museum, it is my honor to introduce the man behind this inspirational lecture series, Simon Ortiz. A member of the Acoma Pueblo, and fluent in Keras, his ancestral language, Simon is one of Indian country's most acclaimed writers and poets. He has written or edited more than 20 books about both his home community and about issues important to Indian people across the United States. Simon has recently, pardon me, Simon has received many honors and awards, including a Pushcart Award for Poetry, the New Mexico Humanities Council Humanitarian Award, the National Endowment for the Arts Discovery Award, the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Writers Award, a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, and was an honored poet recognized at the 1981 White House Salute to Poetry. Currently, Simon is Professor of English at Arizona State University in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. His focus is the decolonization of indigenous peoples, land, culture, and community. With literary perspective as guide, Simon's research, intru <coughs> research interests include cultural, social, and political dynamics of indigenous peoples of North, Central, and South America. He will now introduce our lecturer for this evening, so please give a big round of applause for Professor Simon Ortiz. Hello, good evening, and go on, see. How's everybody? And how's everybody this evening? That's great. Because that's what we all wish for, to be positive, to be uh, in good health, and to be uh, uh, well-balanced, really to feel wonderful about ourselves. Yes? Emmy, yes. That's true. Well, I want to uh, thank the uh, Heard Museum uh, for its, uh, its generosity and its welcoming to all of us. And uh, thank you, Mark. And of course, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, Dr. Lori uh, Arviso Alford. Dr. Alford is uh, a Navajo Nation member, and she's the first woman to be board certified in, uh, first Navajo woman to be certified in surgery. She is presently chief surgeon at uh, Banner Page Hospital in Northern Arizona. And uh, she is uh, presenting tonight's uh, lecture, which is titled, uh, I mean, well, the uh, series is called Simon Ortiz and Labriola Center Lecture on Indigenous Land, Culture, and Community. And she will deliver her talk called the healing properties of Navajo ceremonies. She says, not only do these ceremonies help heal their human participants, uh, 
they also encourage the health of the planet. Subsistence living, she continues, and environmental sustainability principles are also found at ceremony teachings. They are examples of how interconnection can promote sustainability theory and teach humans a way of living that honors and protects our natural world." End of quote. Sustainability the theory is important at ASU, which finds itself as one of the leading institutions in the nation and perhaps the world, and it is where the Global Institute of Sustainability, or GEOS, is located. Dr. Arviso Alpert uh, holds an, also holds an appointment in uh, associate faculty at John, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, Center for American Indian Health, and in Baltimore, uh, Maryland. I have to tell you my own personal uh, connection to Dr. Arviso by telling you of her, her memoir, which is uh, her book called The Scalpel and the Silver Bear, which came out in 1999. And some of you may have copies that you would like for her to sign, and she will after her presentation. And she includes a small poem of mine that I did some years ago, maybe a hundred years ago, a <laughs> long time ago anyway. And she was working on her book at that time and I gave her permission to use uh, uh, that poem which, had been, uh, which uh, she had been, uh, which she had published, was going to publish and which uh, eventually became available. So I'm glad that you are here, one of my well, you will read one of my poems when you uh, uh, read her book. She was, uh, Dr. Alfred uh, was raised in uh, Crown Point, New Mexico, which is where I'm from because that's where Aco or Acoma Pueblo is. Dr. Uh, Alfred is a member of the uh, Sinajini uh, or Ponderosa Pine Clan and also the Ashihi uh, Salt uh, Clan. She earned her undergraduate degree from Dartmouth College uh, in 1979, received her doctorate uh, of medicine at Stanford University School of Medicine in 1985 and completed her residency in general surgery at Stanford University Hospital. In addition to other medical practices and teaching positions, uh, Dr. Uh, Arviso Alford also has served as a member of the National Advisory Council of the NIH Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine from 2008 to 2010. Her research has focused on surgical outcomes and health disparities in Native American populations. Additional interests include Native American health, Native American healing, integrative uh, medicine, and the creation of healing environments. Dr. Uh, Arviso Alford has been awarded honorary degrees from Albany Medical College, Drexel University College of Medicine, and Pine Manor College. She has been a commencement speaker at several medical schools, and she is featured in the National Library of Medicine exhibit, Changing the Face of Medicine, honoring pioneer women physicians over the past 150 years. This series biannually uh, in uh, October and March of uh, every academic year uh, of AA ASU, focuses on a variety of topics with an indigenous American perspective. And it is organized by me at, of ASU, who is also a Regents Professor of English and American Indian Studies. It is a series in conjunction with the ASU Labriola National American Indian Data Center and the world-renowned uh, Heard Museum of uh, here in Phoenix, which is where we sit today, tonight. 
Other sponsors uh, are uh, the American Indian Policy Institute, American Indian Studies Program, Department of English, and School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies, all units within the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, as well as the Indian Legal Program, the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law, the School of Arts in the Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts, and Women and Gender Studies in the School of Social Transformation. There is more to tell, but uh, let's meet uh, Dr. Lori uh, Arviso Alford. Uh, let's welcome her and make her part of our lives. You know. Lori? Okay. I just realized I didn't have a timekeeping piece on my podium and I need to keep track of the time. So what am I doing? I'm digging for my iPhone in my purse. All right, we got it. I'm good. Okay, uh, thank you, Simon and Mark. Thank you for your lovely introductions. Uh, Simon's yours was too long and you're cutting into my speech time and I'm not happy about it. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I want to recognize a few people in the audience who uh, came to, um, to uh, be with me. And so, um, is, uh, and if you would either stand or at least raise your hand, is Dr. John Harlan and Dr. Shoemaker here? There you are, you guys are, stand up, you guys are way in the back. This is Dr. Schumacher, who does cardiology at Banner Health uh, for us. And uh, Dr. Harlan, are you here? Yes. Where? Oh my God, you're late. You, somebody get him a, somebody give him a seat because uh, he actually helped me come back into uh, the gastroenterology side of surgery not that long ago, the endoscopies. And then uh, Dr. Susan Stewart, who is uh, featured in my book as well and, uh, and worked with me at Gallup, is in the back. Hi, Susan. And then um, Jacqueline Etsidi and her children are here, and possibly Valerie Brando. These are my cousins, my first cousins. And uh, where are you guys? Hi, Valerie. You came late, too. Good luck having a chair. And, uh, and Jacqueline got here early, and she's good. OK. So with all that, uh, you know, just starting. Uh, I want to start by a proper Navajo introduction. Yat e Lori Arbiso Alvord Yinishye, Sena Jene Do Ashihitine Bashish Chin. So um, to translate, it is, uh, hello, my name is Lori Arbiso Alvord, and I am a member of the Sena Jene, or Black Street Wood Clan, and the Ashihitine, the Salt People Clans and I was raised in Crown Point, New Mexico, and um, spent a lot of time uh, after training in Dartmouth College uh, and Dartmouth Medical School, and then went to help start a new medical school in Michigan, Central Michigan University, and then uh, had the infamous uh, unfortunate misfortune to work at University of Arizona for two years. <clears throat> uh, I, yeah, you, you're, you're, yeah, aren't you guys the guys with the fork? You, you don't like those guys, right? Yeah, okay, just checking. Sh Sparky or, sh what's his name? Is it Sparky? Yeah, okay. Anyway, <laughs> and now I'm at Paige, and um, I'm very, very happy to be there. Uh, it is home, it is the lake, it is um, Lachi, the, the tribal community, Navajo community there. It's uh, very, very good to be home. Um, all right, so, I'm going to talk about uh, Navajo ceremonies today. And uh, I like to begin with a short narrative so you know. I mean, most of you, you're from Arizona, you know what our Navajo ceremonies are kind of like, but some people do not. And I think it's nice to set up a framework. So this narrative is um, from the chapter in uh, Scalpel and the Silver Bear, Ceremony Medicine. And um, yeah, so hang on a sec. Okay, so if you want to just relax, close your eyes if you want. We're going to go to the Yebache for a minute. 
In the center of the winter night was a Hogan surrounded by a cluster of parked pickup trucks. Before the Hogan stood a chair covered with Pendleton and handwoven Navajo rugs. In the chair sat a girl. She was tall, you could tell by the length of her legs, wrapped in blankets. She was lovely, and around her head was tied a red sash. I did not know this young woman personally or her family, but she was clearly ill, and that is why she was here wrapped in blankets on this cold January night in front of the Hogan. She was here to be cured. On this night, everyone had come together for one reason. Talking God, Hashchalti, would dance in the firelight beneath the thick silver belt of the Milky Way to cure this girl. The songs of the night chant tell of the beauty of the Navajo universe. House made of dawn, house made of evening light, house made of dark cloud. Dark cloud is at the house's door. The trail out of it is dark cloud. The jagged lightning stands high upon it. Happily may I walk. Happily with abundant flowers may I walk. Happily with abundant showers may I walk. Happily with abundant plants may I walk. Happily on the trail of pollen may I walk. Happily may I walk. May it be beautiful before me. May it be beautiful behind me. May it be beautiful below me. May it be beautiful above me. May it be beautiful all around me. In beauty it is finished. Hoshona Hasli, Hoshona Hasli, Hoshona Hasli, Hoshona Hasli. The Yebache has to be held on a winter night when the snakes are sleeping and before the thunder comes. And it is said that everyone who attends benefits from the ceremony's healing power. That may explain the size of the crowd here. They would stay all night long outside in winter, but they were also there because this is what they should do, be here on this night. A woman came out and wrapped an extra blanket around the girl and placed a basket with corn pollen in her lap. A medicine man and another man were conferring about their patient standing on either side of the girl. A lot of activity was held inside the Hogan, but only family members would enter that night. For the past few days, sand paintings were made at dawn and destroyed by twilight. Prayer sticks and mutton sandwiches and bowls of chili had been prepared to feed the many people who would come. Then, from beyond the makeshift parking lot, shapes emerged from the dark emptiness. At first, there were only three, and they approached slowly. They were nearly naked, wearing only small skirts of wool and moccasins. Their bodies were painted white with ash. The first was Talking God. His face was a mask of painted buckskin and eagle feathers. He danced toward the girl with a bouncing movement. Spruce branches wreathed his neck. Behind him came Water Sprinkler, the clown, and behind him, third and last, a figure completely hunched over like an arthritic old man. It was Yas Kitty, the hunchback, whose wooden cane spoke into three branches at the bottom like a claw. Their feet stamped in unison. They shook rattles in their right hands. Then Hashchati let loose a series of cries that echoed four times into the night, and together they began to chant a song that belonged to the night. The night chant, like all our ceremonies, is believed to be a gift from the Ye, the ancient holy ones, all of whom come to visit the Diné during this ceremony. The girl came up from her chair and walked to the three dancers and with a wand-like wave of her arm sprinkled corn pollen onto them and then she went back and sat in her chair. The dancers shook their rattles in sweeping gestures toward the earth and went back to where they had come from their brightness closed back into the dark envelope of the mesa. All the people were there to help this girl get well, and she must be aware of the power of her, their collected presence, I thought. She could feel and see and smell this Yebiche medicine. It was hypnotic, the repetitive chants, the smell, the swirl and sting of wood smoke, the rattles and rhythms of drums, the appearance and disappearance of dancers. In spite of my formal medical training, I knew being surrounded by one's family and greater community, seeing dancing holy people smudged with gray ash, bringing healing chants from the dark mesas beyond would have a positive effect on her. 
Ceremonies are magical and powerful things, and energy and a spiritual intensity surrounds the healing ceremony that is almost completely absent in Western medicine. But centrally, the purpose is to bring the patient, help the patient return to a way of thinking and living in harmony and balance, which helps guide the patient's body back to health. During my training at Stanford, I had yearned for something like it for my non-Indian patients there. They sometimes went through their operations alone or nearly alone. Their minds and their spirits were often not prepared for surgery and did not assist in healing them, nor did their families and communities come together for the purpose of helping them heal. And I wondered if other people whose ancestors had been part of tribes centuries ago yearned for tribal identity. And beneath, in the roar of the Yebuche fires, beneath the starry sky, I felt how lucky I was to be part of my own tribe. And even though the night chant had not been for one of my patients, I was glad that I had come. So I hope that gave you a flavor of what it's like and what, what our ceremonies are uh, made of. Of course, there are many, many aspects to it. And uh, as you might imagine, there is absolutely no way to cover all of it in one talk. Um, so I'm just going to mention uh, several highlights. But um, at least we get a framework of, uh, of what we are talking about. So I am up here, and I apologize, the resolution is not as strong with the enhancement and the magnification, but um, this is Lake Powell of Arizona and Utah. And this is Reflection Canyon, uh, really beautiful. And then Antelope Canyon, which of course is na internationally famous. As we start, to talk, I, I also wanted to acknowledge uh, one of my relatives. Uh, my grandmother, my Navajo grandmother's grandfather was Jesus Arviso. Now, this is a picture from the Smithsonian Institution. And um, Jesus uh, was a teenager in the 1850s who was captured. He was Spanish. He had blue eyes and, blonde, uh, blue eyes and fair skin. He was captured by the Apaches in Sonora, Mexico as a teenager, and he was sold to the Navajos. And uh, so for a while, he was a Navajo captive. Can you imagine being captured by the Apaches when you were a teenager, just riding along? Um, he, he is famous for two things. Uh, he was the official translator for the first Navajo treaty with the United States of America. And you can see him over here on the side uh, there with uh, Manuelito and Juanita, some of our very first um, documented tribal leaders. And um, Jesus had um, four wives. Uh, he was quite a guy. Um, there are a lot of Arvisos that are Navajo. Um, and every single one of them that I've ever met can trace their lineage back to this, this man. <laughs> it's pretty wild, quite a guy. Anyway. Um, yeah, so we're going to go uh, to a couple places now. We're going to go actually to um, Chaco Canyon, which is right here in New Mexico. I was, um, as they say, raised down here in Crown Point. And um, we're going to go to Chaco and we're going to go to Canyon de Chez briefly. And I'll touch also on Mount Taylor here. OK, so this is a, a map, actually, of the four sacred mountains. and. Uh, just wanted to point out that Sidna Jenny is right here, Blanca Peak in Alamosa, Colorado. And um, also wanted to point out Sostil, which is Mount Taylor near Grants. And um, primarily just to say that my son Cody's um, placenta is buried on the highest part of Mount Taylor. We bury the placentas of the children to connect them to what we want them to be, uh, have important in their lives. And so for me, it was the cultural sacredness of this mountain. Um, and they say that um, in, in, the, in the telling of the creation stories that um, this mountain was fastened to the earth with a turquoise knife, which I always thought was cool, um, especially because surgeons like knives and, you know. So anyway, um, we also start this talk with an acknowledgment to um, a Sanalyehi, changing woman. 
and she is she created the people from her own uh, being from her own flesh and that's a picture of um, I guess she was pretty large <laughs> the basket is large because the people are small but they're really the right size so she's big anyway and you can see the corn in the back and we're going to talk about corn in a minute too because it's really important it's almost as important as sheep <laughs> inside joke so I said we go to Chaco Canyon first, and so here it is. And Chaco is um, an Anasazi ruin, and uh, it was inhabited by the Anasazi up to 1300 AD. And um, the Navajos say, uh, well, the anthropologists say that the Navajos are descended from them, but the Navajos say no, they aren't. <laughs> um, who to believe? But some of the DNA analyzed from the Anasazi actually uh, compares well with some Navajo DNA, not all Navajo DNA. Navajo is actually, um, it's interesting, some of the clan's names are actually names of other tribes, which, which suggests that some of the tribes came and joined the Navajo, like uh, Maideshgiji is Hamas, and then there's one for Ute, and there's even a Nakai clan. Nakai is Spanish or Mexican. So, you know, it's kind of interesting. We actually have a Western European clan inside of Navajo, but that's how it goes. Um, it's kind of a true reflection of how the world works, right? So the reason I give, come to Chaco first is just to d talk about ancient wisdom, because at Chaco there is this spiral petroglyph, and in this petroglyph um, there's a very center circle and um, during the winter and summer solstices, and only during that time, um, during the, and I get them, always get them mixed up, so don't quote me on this, but during one of them, the light comes down and shines on either side, like you see right here, and then on the other solstice, the light comes right through the middle and shines right and bisects it and pierces the middle. Um, and you say, well, okay, that's sort of interesting. That's kind of like a sundial, stonehenge -y thing, you know? But if you think about it, um, these were people considered primitive by Western societies, and, um, and yet they knew enough about the patterns of the sun to be able to do this, right? And they knew enough about architecture to create these patterns of light, and they knew enough engineering to make it last, um, 800 years, I get, you know? How many things do we have around here that are gonna last for 800 years? Think about it. So these guys were really on their game. Okay, now that we go to um, Canyon de Chez, and this is uh, Spider Rock, and uh, we go to Canyon de Chez to acknowledge the fact that, no, you don't get to come yet, to acknowledge the fact that um, in our history, the night chant is said to have been um, created in the canyon. And the canyon is also the spiritual center of the Navajo universe. Um, there's another place a little south of Canyon de Chez that the New Agers think is the spiritual center of the universe. Anybody know where that is? Sedona, right. And uh, so the Navajos encourage that and they tell them yes that is the spiritual center of the universe because they don't want them all up in the canyon so um, so far it's worked pretty well but uh, the visitation to the canyon has as you probably know increased over the years so, so anyway and this is another picture it is really beautiful there are even apricot trees growing down there Simon was telling me about uh, peaches in Acoma and it made me think of these apricot trees down here um, you wouldn't think they would be there, but there they are, huh? And uh, did the Spanish bring the apricot too, or just the peach? Do you know? Hola. Okay. He doesn't know. <laughs> and this is another picture, very beautiful pictures of these of this canyon, and it always grounds and centers me to start with this place, the canyon. Okay. So in in the ceremonies, there are sand paintings, and um, so here's a picture of a sand painting, and this is made by a medicine man, and they are made without any type of um, template on. You have to know it in your mind. You can't sketch it out ahead of time and then put everything in the right place. And they're a lot like the um, Buddhist mandalas. Mandalas, uh, They're painstakingly elaborate. And uh, here's an example of the sand coming out of his hand to um, actually uh, to 
um, create this, this yay. The yays, you've heard of kachinas, that's the Navajo yays, it's the same thing, but we don't call them kachinas because we're not Pueblo, and so yeah. Um, but this is the, the yays, okay. And uh, just to show you some of the masks of the dancing, of the, the yay and the headdresses that are worn. So um, up here is talking God, and then over here is um, calling God. And then the twin warrior, ch children of changing woman, the twins, this is one twin, and this is one of the other twins, okay? <laughs> Their names are really hard to pronounce, so I'm not gonna pronounce them tonight. They're Navajo names. Um, anybody wanna try to do that? Okay, good. Uh -huh. None of us know. No, we all know, but we, it's really hard to say. And then there's Yas Kitty, which is um, a blue ram. You can see the ram horns coming up. And uh, he plays a really important role in the night chant, so we'll bring him back in a few, in, in a few minutes or in a bit. Okay. This is a rendition of the dancing at the, um, at the um, ceremony of the night chant, the Gebeche. Okay, very, very beautiful. Um, the performers and the costumes that are that are worn. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm heading toward the science. Everybody, take a deep breath. Um, the the Navajo people, the Diné, describe illness as um, being out of harmony or balance in any part of your life. Um, they think of it as one and the same. You can be out of harmony in your mind or your body or your spirit. Whole communities can be in and out of balance. As, um, and also our relationship, the humans, the, um, the two-footed creatures can be out of balance with the animal world, the four-footed creatures, uh, and the environment, the plant world, the earth and the air, the sky water, all of it. So balance or imbalance can occur in any one of these areas. Uh, so um, just to keep that a little bit in mind. Um, what are the ceremonies talking about? What, what is going on inside the ceremonies? Um, if you had to take a ceremony and, and use one word that would describe it, it is that, this word. This word is hojo. Hojo is a state of being. It's a, it's a way of being, and it is um, encompasses the concepts of living in peace and balance and harmony, and then also in beauty. It beauty is part of hojo too. So it's a big, complicated concept, but it's not nearly as big and complicated as saanagai bike hojo. There'll be a test at the end. Uh, better, better memorize it now. Just kidding. Um, so Anna Guy Bekehojo is actually, I think it's the motto for Diné College, the motto or the slogan, right? Yeah. It's a very interesting phrase. Um, so Anna Guy is Father Sky, Bekehojo is Mother Earth. So it's like yin and yang. So Anna Guy is male, Bekehojo is female. Um, translated, it is living a life of spiritual balance and harmony. It's also loosely referred to as walking in beauty. But it's much more than that. So Anagai Bekeho Show is also the name of our creator. It is, um, the creator is a universal force that creates everything. And because it creates everything, everything is deeply interconnected everything is deeply interconnected. And um, when, you, when we have ceremony, the connection with our creator, our, our union is intensified during that time. Um, some of the Hatatli, the medicine men, refer to Sa'anagai Bekehojo as universal mind. Um, <laughs> it's a big idea. It, it is the idea that the universe has a consciousness and that we are part of that consciousness, okay? So it is, um, it is an interesting way of thinking about our, our way of living and being and how we came to be. And um, 
There are some other um, spiritualities that are very similar, that b believe a very similar thing. Uh, but this is, our, this is sort of a big idea. And um, so it sounds really mystical, and it sounds really um, mystical, and <laughs> it sounds, uh, oh, I don't know, really super spiritual and um, all that. But if you back up a few steps and you really think about what it's saying, it is also the description in many ways of our universe in the sense that um, the interconnection sen sense especially. Um, there, you can think of interconnections um, in a variety of ways, um, but I'm just going to list just a couple of them. One of them is air. So we breathe in air and then we breathe it out and that carbon dioxide that we breathe out is breathed in by the plants and then the plants breathe out the oxygen and there's a big interconnected loop right there. Um, we drink the water and then it leaves us and it goes back to the ground and it turns into water again, again and again, over and over. Um, the medicine men say that our breath is um, part of ancient winds that have been on the planet for um, millennia. Um, again, the concept of binder connection with the universe. Um, carbon, we are carbon units. Those of you who do chemistry or biochemistry, we are made of carbon and we trade carbons all the time with our environment. If I eat an apple, that apple becomes part of me, right? And then it goes back and leaves me uh, through the excretions uh, back to the rest of the world, to the earth. And energy, there's another one, is energy. We are interconnected. In other words, that apple holds potential energy, and when I eat it, I get that energy, right? It sustains my energy. And then maybe my energy goes back and trims uh, my garden, which helps promote the energy of all of the plants, or grow seeds, or all these things. So. There, there are many, many, many examples of how interconnected we are, and it's really sort of odd in some ways that Western civilization has not really made this connection. And that's why we have global warming, warming frankly, because they're not really on board with this idea. And I'm not sure why. Um, I want to talk for a few minutes about the mind and then the physical wellness and spirituality in terms of healing. And to start, um, just want to back up and say that, um, that our teachings say that thoughts have great power and that it is possible to think or speak something into existence. And we are always told not to dwell um, on the future in a negative light. So you never say things like, um, I hope my car doesn't break down on the way to work. Mm -mm. You don't, you just kind of don't say those things because it's like calling it to you. Okay, so that sounds a little bit um, non-scientific, if you will, but um, thinking ill thoughts can induce uh, adverse outcomes. So uh, when I was pregnant with Cody, my first child, the Navajo nurses would tell me that I couldn't watch any violent movies and I couldn't have arguments with my husband. I couldn't do any of that stuff. They said, whatever comes into your mind goes into the baby and you have to protect the baby. So of course I started to do those things and to protect myself. They said, you need to be in a tranquil environment state. And then at one of my OB gyn visits, um, uh, I picked up some literature from the March of Dimes and it said that in pregnancy, women should avoid stress because increased stress was associated with premature delivery of the baby. Hmm. I think the Navajo nurses had it covered, you know, because they were trying to erase any stress that could come to, to me. Stress usually comes from, you know, bad things happening around you. So it's really sort of interesting. They saw that connection probably hundreds of years ago, and they knew that what happens to the mind of the mom can actually influence the baby. And that was my first introduction to the concept that the mind can, can influence the body. Now, as time has gone by, that is becoming less and less of an amazing new idea. Um, it was first um, 
first studied by Herbert Benson, really, um, when he was at Harvard. Um, and he really just wanted to see if mind states could control any part of the body. And so he worked, I think, on heart rate and blood pressure first. And um, what he found was that in certain mind states that you definitely, the, the heart rate and blood pressure definitely could change. And that became known as biofeedback. Now, why Western medicine uh, didn't automatically assume that the mind could influence the body is beyond me because frankly the mind is in the body. Um, they're all connected. I mean, is it such a surprise? Really? Um, and then, so to talk about what, you know, this is a study that points out a couple of things. It's a review of the research of the influence of the mind on the body. And one of the things that they found, this is a little bit dated, but I use it because it, of some very specific things that it talks about. Um, they found that psychological stress impaired the immune system. Navajos would tweak that a little bit and say, minds out of balance in, interfere with the ability of the immune system and the antibodies and the IgG and the natural killer cells. Also that depression and stress, minds out of balance, are associated with two processes that, that uh, are involved in cancer, creating cancer, carcinogenesis, poor repair of damaged DNA, and alteration's in apoptosis. Apto apoptosis, say that five times. Apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, which is why we don't get cancers. So if we didn't have programmed cell death, our cells would keep dividing and dividing and just kind of go nuts, and that's what cancer is, right? It's just these cells that are dividing and dividing. So this is so interesting that these mind states that are minds out of balance can be so strong as to interfere with our ability to fight infections with immune system and even cancer. Um, certain mental states are associated with immune function and health in some studies. Some of that was how much control you have over your life and then your view of yourself in the future. Well, why weren't we just talking about that? That the Navajos say you have to look at the future in a good way, that you have to think about the future in a positive way. And isn't that what they're talking about? That the view of yourself in the future actually matters to the health of your body. Things that helped were relaxation training, stress management, and support groups. Well, <clears throat> so support groups help, help the mind, help the body. Well, what is a ceremony but a support group? All the people were there to help this girl get well, and she must be aware of the power of her of their collected presence. I thought There's, ceremonies are some of the first support groups ever. Interesting. So some of you might know Thomas Hatofli. He's actually become kind of famous in his own right, whatever famous means. Um, but he is a medicine man who uh, works at Tuba City Health Center. And um, he is in their mental health, not as a medicine man, actually. He's full, formally trained in mental health. Um, he also usually runs the Boston Marathon every year. He's a marathon runner, and he trains the Tuba City cross-country team. Okay, And, um, and uh, so they're really into running with Thomas. Um, but this is a quote directly from him. And he says, the key to restoring a person to health, whether it is mental or physical, is to purify their thoughts. He says the thought is the foremost energy that we have as people. Ceremonies are done to beautify the thought again. And if that can be done, the body will heal. The rest should follow in terms of the physical self. Um, Thomas has never taken a course in psychoneuroimmunology. Psycho the medicine men have understood this deep connection of the mind to the body for hundreds or thousands of years and have been actively using it. A lot of the ceremony is about purification, about purification and also about healing all the disharmony in your, in your life, including your, your, um, your relationships that lack harmony. And, um, 
So it's it's very it's not diff, not that different in some ways to the Christian ideas of being born again. Being born again, you get a fresh start. You get to start all over. The slate is clean. Nobody's going to blame you for what you did last week. Nobody's going to criticize you for a while. <laughs> um, it's like that. It's almost like if your brain was a hard drive, that it's defragging the hard drive. It's cleaning, it's cleansing. So the ceremony reminds you that you are clean and pure again. And from this new starting place, you move forward with a clean slate. And your whole community is, a, is on board. They're all like, yeah, yeah, we're here at this ceremony and you get to start over. How cool is that, you know? It's like, how many times have you wished you could hit the rewind button and play that piece of life differently the next time around? Yeah. Okay. Going to go back for a moment to Changing Woman. You see her there. She's creating the first clans. Each of the clans, by the way, um, have their own animal guardian. Yeah, it's kind of like that stuff you learned, like what's your spirit, what's your spirit name? You're Indian, aren't you? What's your spirit name? What's your secret spirit name? Well, we don't really have secret spirit names. But you do get, with your clan, you do get one animal, and that's pretty good, right? So, like there's four bear clans, anyway. Um, she is celebrated um, particularly in the girls' puberty ceremony, the Kinalta. So the Kinalta is a time when the girl becomes a woman. It's the time when she begins having her menstrual periods. Uh, and during that time, there was a ceremony for her. Um, she is um, prayed over, and then she lies face down, and the women actually massage her body into a body that is um, beautiful and strong, and strong. Um, she is, as she goes through this process, she becomes stronger and stronger. She runs to meet the dawn, and the, no one can catch her. They all run after her, but no one can catch her. This emphasis on shaping the teen mind into one of empowerment and strength is doesn't really have a good parallel over in Western civilization. Okay, maybe Girl Scouts, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? And even the, the images for many years that women were supposed to aspire to were these incredibly beautiful models that were incredibly thin on the covers of all these magazines. And, and um, you know, 98% of the population could never be that beautiful and could never be that thin. So what were we doing with that? I, you know, what were we doing with that? And did we have an epidemic of bulimia and uh, anorexia as a result of that? Why weren't we telling our women, our young women, that they would be strong, that they would be able to run and no one could ever catch them? They also get a lot of good advice from all the women. They tell them all this advice for how to live. They get a lot of support during this time. Um, so this is where, you know, it's the shaping that your mind is um, so important for a time. Oh, by the way, she's making a huge corn cake that's baked in the ground and the whole community eats pieces of this cake. Um, pretty cool. Uh, except that she has to grind all that corn, which is not cool, but you know, it's a small exchange for getting to, you know, have the support of the whole community and all that. For a time, um, she becomes changing woman. She becomes um, a spiritual being. The changing woman inhabits her. And during that time, the community comes and she can put hands on people and give them healing from changing woman. You know, it's really interesting. Now, does she really? Well, maybe not. But then when you look at psychoneuroimmunology, maybe so. Maybe not. Maybe so. The, the point of it all, though, is that in a, longer, in a longer dialogue of your life, this is how she's starting her adult life. And isn't that cool, you know, that she is empowered to that level? Um, okay, so 
Um, when you think about mind-body medicine, and then you think about the mind, um, and you know the mind has information that comes into it through our senses, through our sight, our sound, our touch, our taste, our smell, and our breath. And um, so on the other side are sort of the parallels, guided imagery, music therapy, chant, drums, touch, massage, uh, on and on, and meditation, breath and meditation. I'm going to take you kind of on a little bit of a twist here in the talk to talk about mind states. Okay, so um, there are some tribes over on the other side of the planet uh, that practice some really interesting things. Uh, they practice something called no thought, it's otherwise known as meditation. It's all, all otherwise known as the mind being completely still, still mind. And you can either do that by, it's really hard to train your mind not to think, but you can go that route and just, when you start to think, you say, oh, I'm thinking, and then you stop thinking and you can go, you can stretch that out a little bit over time. Um, the more accessible route is actually to focus on something so that your mind isn't thinking. Counting your breath, or um, a saying a one single word over and over again. Whatever it takes to keep your mind on one thing so that you're not thinking. The big part is no thought. And it's hard. I've been doing this for, since 2006. Some, some years much more than others. But I can tell you from my own practice that before I started meditating, uh, my life did not have the same quality and dimension to it. Um, when you are able to still your mind, uh, there's a deep sense of fulfillment and, dare I say, even pleasure associated with that phenomenon. And also, answers to problems come when you meditate. Answers that you don't expect come in. It's kind of an odd thing, but um, it's been very real. Um, and so, the tribes I'm speaking of the, on the other side of the planet are, of course, the Buddhist peoples. You know, and there are some of them in China, and some of them in Tibet, and some of them in India, and really kind of all over over there, right? And most of them have some element of meditation as part of their culture, spirituality. Well, as it turns out, native people, um, our ceremonies also involve meditation. Um, if you, if you um, read the chants and the prayers from the ceremonies, there's a great, great deal of repetition. The, with beauty before me, there may I walk, comes again and again and again. And even if someone is praying that knows a very complicated prayer, you can tell from the structure of the prayer that part of it you can keep saying with the medicine man. In other words, um, on the trail of pollen, the medicine call and response, on the trail of pollen, there may I walk. With abundant plants, there may I walk. And you as the patient can keep saying, there may I walk, again and again and again and go into a state of meditation. Um, the drums will do this too. In the, the drums are, if you focus on the drum beat, that will take you to a state of meditation if you stay on the drum beat. Um, guided visualizations are used in Tibetan Buddhist um, teachings um, where they build a very powerful picture, a guided a visualization. And you can tell that the Navajo have this as well in the ceremonies. Um, they will build a whole visual experience out of some of the prayers. Um, Dark cloud is at the house's door. The trail out of it is dark cloud. The jagged lightning stands high upon it, building a very vivid um, guided imagery. Um, and then um, the, there is a area that, has, that I really keep trying to find a way to come understand better. But I, what I can tell you is that in Eastern medicine, uh, in acupuncture, the concept of, of qi, um, qi, it was chi qi. Chi um, is the basis of it all, and it is a system of energy inside the body. 
And that energy is described as having a vibrational component. Now, if you've never had acupuncture, uh, you should probably go try it and see. Um, I had a treatment, actually trained um, almost a, a year uh, in acupuncture. And as part of that, I had a neck treatment because I always get neck muscle pains. And after, the, after they did it, um, I was pain-free for eight months. So it's, it's real. And I've also had a needle put in one part of the leg and then another one in the other part, you know, along the, further down the leg. And then after the needles are removed, I can feel a vibrational energy moving between the two areas. So if it's real, I don't know what it is. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what it is. But I do know, and now nobody else does either, when they find out, they're going to tell us all, I hope. Um, it does have a vibrational component. And because it has a vibrational component, things that influence vibration could be influencing our energy in our body. And those things are sound. In other words, drum and chant and prayer and song, all of those things can be influencing that vibrational energy in our physical being. Okay. So now, um, this is really cool because some very, very astute people in research, um, Richard Davidson from the University of Wisconsin and Sarah Lazar from Mass General actually had this amazing idea to do functional MRIs on um, Buddhist monks. And this is what they found. They found increased lobe activity in the left frontal lobes, which are associated with better focus and attention. That's a part of the brain that has the focus and attention. Also areas of the brain that increase your feelings of happiness and calm and well-being. And then we get a bonus. There's an increased re immune response to the influenza vaccine. I do not know why they put that one in there, but they, that's what they found out. This is an example of this MRI. And um, the area in green is the insula. And um, the um, prefrontal area is the blue circle um, over on the right. And those areas of the brain were actually thicker in meditators. The cortex is thicker. The brain grows or something in these meditators. I guess what I'm trying to say is that their practices actually influence their physical being, their, their, brains, their brain's physiology. I just think it's the wildest thing. And I suspect that if you went and checked and tested some of the Native Americans who do a lot of prayer and chant, you might find something very similar. But you will not find that anytime soon because um, Navajos are not into research most of the time, and particularly on their most sacred things. So um, that's because of how badly research has treated these populations in the past. So yes, but this is what happens in people who meditate, and I highly, highly recommend it. Um, and now I'm going to speed up a little bit because I want to be sure that we don't end too late. But um, I want to talk about the physical wellness for a moment. Um, traditional lifestyles, lifestyles that don't involve technology, that means living out on the res without any running water and without any electricity. They are physically vigorous lifestyles. They require you to use your body for so many things, to haul water, to chop wood, to hunt, to grow things. In the past, before technology came to tribes, physical wellness was not uh, physical wellness was was not something that's optional. You couldn't just sit on the couch and be obese and eat potato chips. No, you had to, to use your body to survive. Your very survival depended on your physical wellness, and. Um, and you know, it's so interesting that if we actually took away all these things that do so many, these machines that do so many great things for us and used our bodies more, we would totally be healthier. We could eliminate uh, some of the osteoporosis just by carrying and lifting more. Our bones get stronger. And as I said, the, the running is built into the spirituality, so we really prize physical well-being. Also looking at food, 
um, traditional diets um, may, had much more vegetables and less meat because meat was really precious. If you killed a deer, it had to last the whole winter sometimes. You couldn't eat a Big Mac every day. It's like, no. You, so the balance of what we ate was so much healthier. And then again, ceremony encodes healthy food, if you can believe it. Um, this is a sand painting of um, Mother Earth and Father Sky. And um, Mother Earth has sacred plants, corn, squash, beans, and tobacco. And then Father Sky has the sun and the moon. Um, this, these plants actually, when they're planted, they, they actually help each other grow. If you're a gardener, you probably know these things. And also the nutritionists say that these three plants can sustain a person, 97% of a person's nutritional needs. Kind of cool that they chose those three plants. Um, tobacco is the mountain tobacco, um, and I think that the reason it is there as sacred is actually to limit it to only the times that you are, are actually in prayer and ceremony. In other words, that's the way that you don't smoke three packs a day. But that's just my thought. I have no idea if that's true or not. Um, so our traditional diets are based on grain and vegetables and fish and meat. And then we have berries and nuts that are high in antioxidants. So just by going back to what we used to eat, we could really cut down on obesity and the healthcare disparities associated with it. Because what is an American diet, you know? Fructose and sucrose and starches and fats and okay, we got rid of most of the trans fats eventually. And, but think about it, you know? All this processed food is not good for the body. The body knows what the body needs to eat. The body eats what it used to eat before all this other stuff came along. And here's another one, uh, sand painting again of, of uh, Mother, uh, Father Sky and Mother Earth. See how beautiful the, the sand paintings are. I just had to throw another one in. Um, and this is sort of my, my last, almost last, I always say last, but almost last concept. Um, so, to talk about spirit, um, I wanted to talk about uh, how that influences our relationship to the natural world, to the animals and the environment. Um, so Danae say they are spiritual beings, part of everything in the universe, that our breath is part of sacred winds, as I said, and our, our, our definition of health is not just as individual well-being, but well-being of all components of the universe, because everything is interconnected and if our air isn't clean, then we aren't healthy. If our earth isn't clean, then we aren't healthy. If our water isn't clean, then we aren't healthy. So if you see these native people getting all upset about the Keystone Pipeline or this or that or whatever else, it's because they get it. They know that somewhere down the line, we're going to pay a price in terms of sacrificing part of our environment. Um, so this, this spirituality and the ceremonies actually help to build our relationships to our, each other as humans and then also to the non-human world, the animals and the environment. Also, the natural world is sacred. When anthropologists first came and started to <clears throat> study us, they said, oh, they're primitive because they worship the, you know, the environment. They worship the sun and they worship the moon and they worship... And yet, if you take the natural world and place, you code it as something sacred, and you also refer to it as family. In other words, the earth is our mother, the sky is our father, the animals are brothers and sisters, the bear, the eagle. You've heard these references. If you give them that value assignment inside a culture, the things that a culture will protect and defend beyond all cost are that which is sacred. So if you give something a sacred label, that's what you protect and defend. And it's family or sacred, right? Well, we give the environment both. We give them the family value and a sacred value. And up until non-native people came, the earth was pretty darn clean and pure in the air and everything else. I don't understand why Western civilizations did not try to do something similar. Um, they'll be, I guess, playing catch up as we all are. But um, clearly, this um, primitive way of, of um, practicing religion has huge um, returns on sustainability theory and on our relationship to the world around us. 
Um, this is a Navajo artist, Harrison Begay's rendition of this concept of living harmoniously with the animals and the air, the clouds, the sky, the earth, and all of that. Um, inside the night chant, there is, um, I call it the dream of the blue ram. Part of the night chant talks about a dream. And I'll bring back our blue ram. He's down here. Yas Kitty. And so what it says is that um, a boy had a dream. And in the dream, rams with blue faces came to him. And they said, your people are killing more game than they need. They are killing more game than they need. And this is throwing the universe off of balance. And um, they need to stop this. And if they do not stop, there will be a famine and people will starve and there will be suffering. And so the boy went to the hunters of the tribe and told them this dream. And the hunters laughed at him and they said, go back to your dreaming and let us do the hunting. Men. <laughs> Just kidding, I like men. Um, the prophecy came to pass. The people remembered this dream. And after that, they resolved that they would never take more than they need of anything. Not just the game, but anything. And that is what subsistence living is. And that is what we are taught. We're also taught that if you butcher, you should use every part of that animal out of respect for the animal's life and out of this principle of, of um, not wasting, not wasting things. And uh, there's the blue ram in um, sand painting and then in petroglyph. So he's been in the Southwest for a very, very long time. Very long time. Yes, Kitty. Brings such wisdom, potentially the protection of our, our beautiful blue jewel in the sky called Earth, right? It's the only one we have right now. We better not screw it up. So these are the values of what the teachings are of the dream of the blue ram. You should not take more than you need. Use everything fully. Give what you, some of what you have to those who cannot hunt or care for themselves. Leave everything the way you found it. These are sound ecological principles for conservation of natural resources. And following these principles can result in the preservation of a pure habitat for humans to live in. This is uh, Glen Canyon during a rainstorm. And I would really, I really hope that my grandchildren get to see this, and I hope my great grand, their grandchildren get to see this. Many tribes say we should think about what our actions in terms of its effects five generations into the future. You've heard this story, yes. I hear, I see nodding. And then, um, just wanted to bring in the idea of the arts because so many of you who support the herd and support the arts, you know, healing actually can come from the arts again through the senses, right? That it can help the mind recover, relax, be energized, be happy. You know, read some of Simon's poetry. It is incredible what it will do. Sometimes the shivers go down your spine, right? And then art is, of course, being used inside these ceremonies as well. Music and dance and the regalias and the rhythm of drums and chant and sand painting and sacred objects and on and on and on. You could just keep going and going. Uh, likewise, the natural world can play a role in healing us too. Both the animals and the environment can, call, can bring comfort and calm to us as human beings. And sometimes I had a grandfather who used to say, my chapel is on top of a mountain. How many of you have had relatives that have say that their chapel is at the ocean, that their chapel is the, the, the beautiful world that we live in? And, uh, and then I'm going to end here with uh, shiprock and dark cloud and storms. Thank you very much.